Uh, my name is Brian Edwards. I'm with Los Alamos National Laboratory. And um, I guess one of you asked a few minutes ago uh, what happened to the markets for malware presentation that I think is on your uh, schedule. It just evolved into uh, measuring and integrating the shadow economy, a sector-specific approach. Um, as an economist, we are often involved in doing impact analyses. Uh, we certainly do a lot of it at Los Alamos for, uh, you know, we analyze the impacts of hurricanes and other kinds of uh, catastrophic, uh, catastrophic events on regional economies as well as, uh, and we also look at impacts on critical infrastructure. Uh, we got interested in the unofficial economy or the shadow economy. There's lots of different names for it um, because there are, uh, there are our own economy but also the economies of other countries that have small or ranging from small to significant parts of their economies that are unofficial. And um, so I wanted to, uh, we started thinking about um, uh, ways of looking at this from an economic perspective. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, the scope of shadow economic activity um, and look at some comparisons of the shadow economies in the U.S. and other countries, why they exist, um, and then the, uh, w what we're really beginning and what you're seeing here is some very preliminary work on taking a slightly different or actually a pretty different view of the shadow economy with respect to the rest of the economy as a whole. Um, traditional views of the shadow economy have been what economists would call macroeconomic. They've basically said, well, the shadow economy in Belarusia is about 30 or 40 percent of the GDP of uh, the gross domestic product of Belarusia. In the United States, it might be 8 to 10 percent of the economy of the United States. And one of the tables that I'll be showing you in a few minutes will show some of the international comparisons. Um, this is a table that is adapted from um, a Journal of Economic Literature um, review article that you can get on the web. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm sort of bouncing back and forth between this microphone, and so if I'm not doing that right, let me know. Um, and this was a kind of a taxonomy of shadow economic um, activity. And a lot of the shadow economic activity that people talk about is the usual suspects, uh, gambling, prostitution, uh, illegal drugs, uh, trade in stolen goods, and so forth and so on. And um, there's kind of an interesting anecdote, at least to me. This article was published in the year 2000, and I actually had to add, and if you go to the top left cell of this where we have monetary transactions and illegal activities, that italicized piece is something I added um, because in the year 2000, people really didn't, um, you know, hacking and, you know, the shadow information sector activities that people talk about now was not something that was really, um, I guess, significant enough at that time to be included. But again, I'm, I'm quite new to this area, so I really don't know when it started becoming more significant. But anyway, in any case, this is sort of a uh, taxonomy that's in that Journal of Economic Literature article. If any of you have access to JSTOR or if, you know, you could get your hands on this article, it's quite interesting and it gives you a pretty good overview of how economists look at um, illegal activities. Um, as far as measuring the shadow economy or the unofficial economy or underground economy, however you want to put it, um, most of the studies, as I said a little while ago, have been in the macroeconomic, um, have taken a macroeconomic point of view. They have, they have just looked at, well, we think it's about 20 percent of GDP or 10 percent of GDP and so forth. And we've really had little attempts, very few attempts, to try and measure it uh, in more of a microeconomic uh, sense. Microeconomic, I mean, in terms of looking at individual sectors of the economy, industries of the economy, that will have unofficial subparts. Um, and so what we're looking at here is, is the beginnings of some work that might look at a shadow agricultural sector or a shadow manufacturing sector or a shadow information sector, which is what I'm focusing on today, um, that would accompany the economic ac the activities of the official versions of these sectors. Um, 
and here are just some uh, shadow economy in the U.S. I think I've already mentioned that about 8 to 10 percent of U.S. GDP is considered unofficial. Um, but the evidence that we have on this is largely anecdotal. Uh, the official measuring that they do in the federal government captures some of the unofficial activity, but it doesn't really capture all of it. Um, and as far as international comparisons are concerned, um, we have some pretty wide uh, variances across countries. Thailand, Nigeria, Egypt are estimated to be about 70 percent of their re respective gross domestic products. Guatemala, Mexico, and Peru are 40 to 60, and Philippines, Sri Lanka, and so forth. Some of these other countries are a little smaller. And I don't know if you can read this. I hope you can, but this is, um, uh, again, adapted from that Journal of Economic Literature article. They're basically giving you a sense of the ranges of um, the sizes of the shadow economies in these different countries. Um, Japan, United States, Austria, Switzerland, relatively small. Uh, Nigeria, Egypt, at the other hand, uh, relatively large. Um, there's been a lot of economic uh, interest by economists in illegal activities. Um, going back to the work uh, by Gary Becker, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in the mid to late 1980s, I believe, um, the idea is that people engage in shadow economic or illegal activities because of incentives. And the incentives can be um, anything from just monetary incentives, um, and it can also be affected by the institutional regulatory environment that people live. Um, um, in the Soviet, in the former Soviet Union, there was a large black market. Uh, there were large black markets there because there were price controls. And uh, in the former Soviet Union days, um, most goods and services uh, that were available had two prices. There was an official price, and then there was an uh, that was in rubles, and then there was the unofficial price that was also in rubles, but it was a lot more rubles. Um, but there's lots of incentive areas of in where, where the incentives to engage in shadow economic activity can exist. And some of the incentive areas that we're in, we, we've been interested in have been the burden of taxes and social insurance contributions, the intensity of regulation, social transfers, labor market regulation as well, and public sector services. Um, and uh, some of these incentives issues, for example, the burden of taxes and social insurance contributions, if, if workers and employers are required to pay taxes and make contributions to social insurance, there may be cases where they may consider this too costly and so people are going to be paid under the table. Um, and so this, so, so um, you know, there, so that activity is automatically going to go from being official to unofficial. Um, there's a, um, uh, there's a fellow by the name of Loeza who estimated the size of shadow economies in 14 Latin American countries and found that the greater tax burdens and labor market restrictions increase the size of the shadow economies of those countries. So there's just a fairly natural response to the incentives that are created by the country's regulatory makeup. Um, and it also um, applies to the intensity of regulation, where the increased regulation reduces individuals' choices in the official economy. And so they're going to want goods and services. Uh, if they're not available officially, they will try and go um, outside and get them. And, um, and suppliers will do the same thing. They will find ways to supply these, uh, albeit illegally. Um, and shifting regulatory costs to employees provides incentives for workers to supply labor to the shadow economy, another finding. As far as social transfers are concerned, um, a social transfer is basically any kind of tr transfer payment from the government to someone else. Um, social welfare systems can increase tax rates, um, reducing incentives to work in the official economy. And the system can also provide disincentives for individuals receiving welfare payments to work in the official economy. If it's more costly to do something, less people are going to do it. If it's less costly to do something, more people are probably going to do it. So there's, um, uh, y y that's, what, that's what you learn when you get a PhD in economics. Um, <laughs> my father used to tell me, all you ever need to know about economics is buy low and sell high. And I think he was probably right, but who knows. Um, labor market regulation, um, overregulation and labor costs in the official labor market are, are driving forces for the shadow economy, according to Schneider and Anstey 
Again, I'm giving you kind of a quick rundown of some of the literature on this. Uh, forced reduction in working hours can, uh, can often encourage shadow economic activity. I know that in France, for example, they've been going back and forth on number of hours restrictions um, and uh, the, in the idea is, is if people can only work 45 hour 35 hours a week, for example, then there's going to be more people that are going to be employed. Well, there may or may not be, but there's probably also going to be more people employed in the shadow economy as well. Um, and public sector services, again, if, if, if um, there's also a feedback effect that we talk about here, if there's an increase, if an increase in shadow economy decreases government revenues because now you're doing stuff that's under the table. This can reduce the quantity and quality of public services, which can then lead to higher taxes. And so there can be a negative feedback that occur uh, under those circumstances. Um, as I've said before, and I, I, I've, people accuse me of being very repetitive in my presentations, and I'm probably just as guilty today as I've, as I've, as, as I've always been in the past. The, um, the previous work that attempts to link shadow and official economy, economic activity have been macroeconomic. There's a uh, Houston who developed business cycle model. Business cycles are, is an analysis of, of the ebb and flow of macroeconomic activity. Okay, 10 minutes, thank you. Um, Adam and Ginsburg focus on the implications of the shadow economy on official growth. So there's been analyses that have been done that have tried to say, well, okay, we have this official economic activity that it takes place. What does that have, an ef what effect does that have on official economic activity? Um, now, w as I said at the beginning, we can, we can, w what we're attempting to do here is look at shadow economic activity from, s in terms of specific sectors and how those specific sectors integrate with the rest of the economy. And again, we could have looked at agricultural underground activity um, marijuana growing, I suppose, would be an example of that. Um, and um, we could talk about illegal services, uh, prostitution, gambling, at least outside of Clark, um, outside of Clark County, or outside of the state of Nevada, um, and other kinds of activities that take place in different sectors, chemical manufacturing and illegal drugs, for example. Um, but what I'm focusing on today um, is the information sector, what, what the National Income Accounting System refers to as the telecommunications, data processing, data services sector of the economy. And uh, the kinds of economic activities that we're talking about are basically computer system hacking, trading stolen information, identity theft, spamming, and other activities. And I'm sure there's lots more, um, um, and, uh, and you could, I'm sure any one of you could give me a, a much more thorough rundown of what those activities are. Um, and what I wanted to look at was what are called input-output models. And what an input-output model is, um, and I don't know how familiar you are with these kinds of models in economics, it's basically looking at the economy from the point of view of different industries that purchase outputs from other industries in order to produce whatever goods and services they produce. So when an when a automobile manufacturer manufactures a car, they are purchasing commodities and raw materials from other industries. They may purchase the tires that go onto the car from th another part of the manufacturing sector. Um, and um, it's very common for, you know, for years the U.S. economy has been looked at from this perspective. And <coughs> what I'm giving you, what I want to start with is a very simplified three-sector official U.S. economy um, where I've taken the all, you know, 20 some odd sectors of the economy and I'm, I've aggregated them up into three sectors. And uh, I'm going to be looking at manufacturing services and others. So we're just going to have an economy that where, where we've left manufacturing alone, uh, we've left services alone, and then we've taken everything else, ag, construction, utilities, and so forth and so on, and we've just aggregated that into one big other category, just for purposes of keeping things simple and manageable. And um, based on 2002 data, where we have a GDP of approximately $10.7 trillion, we have an economy that looks something like that. And these are a little strange to read, but basically if you were going to read across the manufacturing row, 
Um, the manufacturing to manufacturing cell is basically telling you that about 1.3 um, trillion dollars of manufacturing output put was purchased by the manufacturing sector. And about 1.018 trillion dollars of manufacturing output was purchased by the services and other sector. The services and other sector was then, then turns around and makes goods and services with, with those inputs. And then if you were going to stay in the services and other column, for example, that would be just telling you what outputs from services and other and, manuf and information that they were purchasing from those sectors in order to produce those outputs. If you take the first three columns and sum them up, you get the total intermediate use. That's the total intermediate input purchases that they buy from these industries. And um, that, along with what we call final uses, which is GDP. If you ever took a macroeconomics principles class in college and they said, well, GDP is consumption investment plus government spending got you, uh, plus net exports, that 1.392.6 trillion dollars is what that number is. But that's not really the total output of the economy. The total output actually includes all of those interme all that intermediate production that took place as well. So when you add those, that the, the, the what, fourth and fifth columns, and you get the total commodity output of 3.8 trillion. That's really the number that we look at. Anyway, so, um, and that is basically just an input-output representation of a hypothetical, or it's not really a hypothetical economy, it's the actual economy, it's just a very highly aggregated version of the economy, at least as far as the um, services and other sectors are concerned. Um, now we're gonna consider an economy with an added shadow information sector, and we decided to look at one or three percent of the official sec information sector output as a as sort of an estimate of how big the shadow information sector is. And we did that because there's a, an OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development report, measuring the non-observed economy that got about, that estimated the size of the information sector in the United States to be about one to three percent of the official information sector. So it's pretty small, okay. And we basically created a shadow information sector, which is now that fourth column. There's an official information sector, which is the same as before. But now if you add that fourth column, we've basically added a little bit more. And we've added those inter-industry purchases. In other words, the shadow information activity is going to take place. But shadow economic activity, even though it may be illegal, okay, they're also engaging and interacting with other official sectors of the economy. Okay? And um, and that's one of the things that we're really trying to pick up is if we want to model this, we won't, won't, don't want to just look at the aggregate. We want to see how it's interacting with other industries. Um, and then we basically go through the same, and again, these are very, very preliminary estimates of, of how big it is, but the GDP is going to be slightly larger now because we're now measuring economic activity that we weren't measuring before. Okay. Um, let me go back to that. And so that's what our, this is a again a very, very rough preliminary estimate of what, it, of what this total economy would be with the shadow e uh, economic activity added. Um, and then we uh, d discussed the 1% case. Um, GDP is slightly higher and, um, and w we show only, the, only the addition of a shadow information sector other shadow sectors could easily be added, ag and so forth. We don't really get into the issue of burdens that are imposed, but we know that there's additional economic activity that's taking place as a result of shadow economic activity. Um, uh, you know, Peter Norton, I think, probably owes his existence to um, the, the, the shadow economy. Um, and we're not really talking about additional burdens uh, that, um, that th this activity imposes. And I'm not being judgmental at all about this. I'm just looking at it very coldly and crudely as an economist. Um, and the other thing, though, is that if, if spending my additional firms take place, and this is another area where we'd have to fine tune our estimates a little bit more, um, if, fir if firms in the official economy are, are, expend are, are engaging in other kinds of activities, spending additional money to protect their networks, or if, if I as a consumer have to go out and buy anti-spamming software or something like that to protect me from spammers, then that has a negative impact on me. And it also uh, has an impact on the expenditures that 
are undertaken by these other firms. So if you went back to this table, um, there would be a, there would be an ad additional uh, activity throughout the all the cells of this table that would reflect that. And I'm getting down to about a minute, I think. The discussion with the three percent case is roughly the same. Um, we've also got some very very rough estimates of employment in the hacker economy. Some something on the order of about three million people. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, the information sector having about three million people. And if we apply this 1% estimate, we get about, about 34,000 people involved in this uh, underground economy um, uh, nationwide. And the higher end estimate would, make, would multiply that number by three. Um, and some summary conclusions, uh, or some summary, as far as summaries and, c and conclusions are concerned, um, it's very hard to get information about this sector, so really getting reliable estimates of how this would work, of what these numbers are, is, is, is likewise difficult. The, this sector of the economy is, is always in a state of flux, um, and so I think we may just, just by the nature of the beast, um, be stuck with just Okay, I've been I've been given the um, skull and crossbones, which means that I have to be quiet. Um, but anyway, um, I'll be over in 106. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And thank you very much for your time. And I know that this is probably a very strange topic for this convention, but um, I, I thank you very much for having me. And um, and, and uh, thank you.